Number 1. Lori Nesson Any detective will tell you that sometimes all it takes is one piece of information to solve a case. Reynoldsburg police got that tip on a cold case after four to six long years. On September 28, 1974, Lori Nesson appeared. She had attended a high school football game and subsequently a house party, according to the police. Nesson was last seen walking home just after midnight. Nesson's naked body was discovered in a ditch on Rose Hill Road, but her garments were strewn across several miles. Due to the limited technology available at the time, the case became cold. At the request of Nesson's family, the Reynoldsburg Division of Police reopened the investigation in August 2019. Officer Craig Bradford took on the case because his daughter was 15 at the time, the same age as Nesson. Officer Bradford claims that the more he looked at the files, the more he discovered contradictions. Pictures that, at the autopsy, showed some cuts on her lip, things that would indicate foul play. The time of death on Nesson's odyssey also didn't match up with when the teen was last seen. Bradford presented his findings to the Eckling County Coroner in 2020, who agreed to investigate the case. A few months later, the coroner's office amended the cause of death to undetermined homicidal violence. Then in December, a local news channel broadcasted an update on the nascent situation. After the program aired, someone contacted him with information that night. The caller was Karen Adams's cousin, and she said the news article of Lori's death was quite similar to her cousin's homicide. A similar case had happened six months after Nesson's death on March 9, 1975. Adams, then 17, was walking from her White Hall home to a friend's house when she disappeared. The next day, her body was discovered in a ditch on Vangert Road near Blacklick. The similarities were too strong to ignore. The authorities contacted the Franklin County investigator who was in charge of the Adams case, which had been solved in 2011. The Franklin County Sheriff's Office Detective Chuck Clark told him that they believed the two guys who killed Adams also killed Nesson. I've always suspected these two individuals were involved in something bigger than what they were caught for, Clark added. They drank, drove around the city, went anywhere they pleased, and approached girls and young ladies who were alone. Robert Meyer was 70 years old when DNA evidence tied Tim and Charles Weber to Adams' murder in 2011. He was apprehended by authorities in Cincinnati. He was sentenced to 15 years to life in jail, but he died in prison just a few years later. Weber, on the other hand, was already deceased and cremated, but his son submitted a cheek swab that revealed his DNA, proving his involvement in Adam's murder. Meyer and Weber were identified as the men responsible for Nesson's death by the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigations. Nesson's family is understandably troubled by the fact that her sister's final moments were probably spent in terror at the hands of two men they will never meet. According to investigators, Meyer and Weber both had a criminal background that put them in the old Ohio penitentiary in the 1960s. Meyer was sentenced to 10 years in prison in 1963 for murdering a man with a hammer. Weber was jailed for robbery. Following their release, the two moved in together and lived in Whitehall in 1974. Both men were convicted three years later of rape and kidnapping at least two women in the Toledo region. According to the investigator, one thing is certain. They were serial murderers and rapists. They would lure victims inside the car, joy ride with them, and then sexually assault and kill them. Of course, knowing what they did to Lori and Karen, and knowing that there were about six months between that and then their activity in Toledo a year later, they would have had plenty of opportunities to victimize other young girls. The police are actively seeking information regarding similar cases in that period. Nesson's family expressed hope that her cold case will provide hope to other families. I sincerely hope that this opens a door for other families who are waiting for answers, said her sister. No one should have to wait four to six years for anything. Number 2. The case of Junko Furuta is different. This is one of the few cases that will shake you to your bones and make you boil with rage from start to end. It's not fascinating. It's just horrible. The only mystery here is how human beings can be so unimaginably cruel and how a judicial system can fail an innocent girl so badly after everything she went through. Before we dive right into the case, please note that the content of this video may trigger people on the topics of rape, torture, and murder. Let's get right into it then. Junko Furuta was a 17-year-old high school student living in Saitama Prefecture in Japan in 1988. She was smart, ambitious, 
and generally well-liked by everybody around her. Her grades were great. She stayed away from alcohol and drugs, and she was working at a plastic molding factory in her free time to save up for a trip she planned on taking after graduation. She had also accepted the job that she planned to take on after she graduated. Needless to say, she had a bright future ahead. Unfortunately, for her, she went to school with some juvenile delinquents who were also ranking Yakuza members. Hiroshi Miyano, Jihugiro, Shinji Minuto, and Yasushi with the Nabi. Miyano had a history of committing crimes and apparently had been getting into trouble since elementary school. Reportedly, Miyano had a crush on her and had even confessed his feelings to her before. But she rejected him because she wanted to focus on her studies. Miyano's horrible reputation and his connections to the Yakuza scared most people quite a lot, but Furuta had the courage to outrightly tell him no. On November 25, 1988, Miyano and Minuto were wandering around to find a victim to kidnap and rape. It just so happened that Furuta was riding back home around 8.30 p.m. after her shift at her job. Under Miyano's orders, Minuto kicked Furuta off her bike and ran away from the scene. Miyano then approached her and pretended to help her out to try and get her to trust him. Unfortunately, she did. Miyano led Furuta to an old warehouse and immediately began threatening to kill her if she did not listen to him. She tried to fight back, but he managed to overpower her, after which he raped her and then led her to a hotel close by where he raped her again. When he called up his friends to brag about exploiting her, the group reportedly asked him to keep her there to allow multiple people to take advantage of her. Miyano eventually took her to a park where his friends were waiting, after which they went through her bag and found her address written in her notebooks. To force her to cooperate, they threatened to kill her family if she tried to escape. They finally took her to Minuto's house, which would be her prison for the next 44 days. On November 27, Furuta's parents contacted the police to report her disappearance. This made her captors force her to call her parents and tell them that she had run away and was otherwise fine. They believed her and dropped the case. The boys also forced her to act like Minuto's girlfriend when his parents were around, but quickly dropped the pretense when they realized that his parents would not report him to the police. The boys brutally tortured her over the next month. The brutality of the tortures escalated over time and initially began with humiliating her sexually before inflicting physical pain. While they also gave her limited food and water initially, they eventually stopped that and gave her a diet of cockroaches and milk instead. Their later statements revealed that their tortures included, but were not limited to, making her stand outside naked during the winter, force-feeding her large amounts of alcohol, making her smoke multiple cigarettes at once, urinating on her, beating her, penetrating her with various objects, and burning her with lighter fluid. They even stated that at one point, they penetrated her with a hot light bulb that exploded inside her. Take a moment to let that sink in. Animals treat other animals better. These boys turned into complete monsters while Furuta continued to do her best to defy them and fight back. Not before long, however, the severity of the attacks and her near-to-nothing diet began to take a toll on her body. She became crippled and could not move at all. Her face became swollen, she was severely malnourished, and her body was so injured that it became unable to urinate. As a result, her flesh began to rot while she was still alive. Her condition made her captors lose all sexual interest in her, and they found another 19-year-old woman to gang rape, who, like Furuta, was also on her way home from work. On January 4, 1989, a final brutal attack on her would end her life. Miyano had lost a game of mahjong the night before and decided to vent his anger out on Furuta. For over two hours, her captors tortured her and beat her repeatedly. They poured lighter fluid on her and set her on fire multiple times, which she apparently tried to put out before she became unresponsive. They dropped dumbbells on her stomach, forced her to drink her own urine, placed short candles on her eyelids, and dropped hot wax all over her body. At some point, they covered their hands with plastic bags to continue beating her. She eventually went into a state of shock and began to convulse, after which she succumbed to her injuries and soon passed away. The following day, Minuto's brother called to inform them that Furuta may have died, after which the panic group loaded her body in a drum and filled it with wet concrete. They went on with their lives until Miyano and Aguru were arrested on January 23rd for the gang rape and kidnapping of the 19-year-old from December. Women's underwear was found at the redresses, and they were finally questioned over two months later. 
During their interrogation, Miano thought that one officer knew about his role in Furuta's murder, thinking that Igura might have been fast. Out of sheer chance, he told the officer where to find her body, which puzzled them since they thought that he might have been talking about another unsolved murder. The police found her body in the concrete drum the next day and identified her by her fingerprints. Several arrests were made immediately afterwards. The court initially kept the identities of the boys a secret because most of them were still minors. But a Japanese magazine called Shuken Banshu found out who the accused were and published them. They said that because of the severity of the crimes that they committed, they did not deserve to have the right of anonymity. All of the accused pleaded guilty to the charges of committing bodily injury that resulted in death instead of murder. This is where the case gets even more heartbreaking. The ringleader Miano was sentenced to just 17 years in prison. He appealed to the court, but they gave him an additional three years instead. The rest of the boys got much lighter sentences, serving only seven to eight years because they were below 18 at the time. All of them were released by 2010 and went on to commit more crimes, with Minato even being charged for beating and slashing the throat of another man. Another incident shows that after a guru was released, he was soon arrested again for beating a man for four hours because he thought that his girlfriend was involved with him. He allegedly boasted about his role in Furuta's rape, torture, and murder, and even told his victim that he had killed four and knew how to get away with it. Furuta's grave was also vandalized numerous times by a guru's mother later on because she believed that her son's life was ruined by her. Yeah, this case is beyond messed up. I know that while researching for this video, I was disturbed for days. It really makes you think about how messed up we have to be as a society to let the convicts of such a ghastly crime off so easily. Because guess what? If you don't give monsters like this the punishment they deserve, it only encourages them to commit more crimes. They learn that their actions have little consequence. Yep, this case really had the worst kind of resolution ever. What makes this case so unimaginably horrible is not just the gruesome treatment Junko went through for 44 agonizing days, but also that she never got the justice she deserved, even over 30 years later. Her rapists, torturers, and killers walk free in Japan today and have carried out more crimes since then. To give you some perspective, people who have been arrested for carrying marijuana have received longer sentences than these actual monsters. While Furuta never got the justice that she deserved, we can only hope that by remembering the names and the faces of her captors and by remembering her bravery, we can play a part in contributing to what she never received at court. Minor Mini Soriano Murder Case It was a chilly winter day in 1999 when a 13-year-old girl, Minor La Soriano, aka Mini never returned home from school. She used to study in 7th grade, was very smart, and was considered a bit mature for her age. Many love poetry and have a deep fascination with rainbows. After several days of going missing, this flower-like girl was found dead in a dumpster in the Bronx, New York. She was found stuffed in a bag in that garbage dumping bin. Even though the medical examiner dismissed the idea of the occurrence of any sexual assault on Minnie, traces of semen were found on her sweatshirt. It was revealed that the cause of Minnie's death was strangulation. The task force formed by the NYPDD in 1999 looked into the case with Detective Michael Legiovane is one of the chief investigating officers of this team. What followed was an intense round of interrogation of the near and far acquaintances of many family members. DNA testing was carried out at great lengths by sending samples from minis, clothing, hair, and nails. But guess what? The results did not show any matches. The New York City Chief Medical Examiner, Dr. Barbara Sampson, had said the hardest. Cases that we deal with as medical examiners are those involving children. What was done with her is something that has been haunting me for nearly 20 years. Since, when it's a homicide like this, and when there were no really good leads as to who did, it's the most troubling kind of case for us. When nothing conclusive came out, despite conducting an intensive investigation for a year, the team lost the leads, and the case literally turned hold. However, nearly two decades later, the NYPDD got the enthusiasm to reopen this case. Under Raymond, one of the first great detectives of New York, they went through a great deal of inquiries, interrogation, and investigation until they came up with the possible theory that Miterless was murdered by someone who was not a stranger, but known to hurt. By resorting to the latest technology, familial DNA, 
a major breakthrough was attained. Once the result of this DNA test was obtained, the detectives narrowed down the search result to five relatives of Martinez's people who could have connections to Minnie's murder. There is one fact about Minnie that we didn't really share with you all before. Did you know that this bubbly little girl had a great interest in astronomy? One of her classmates revealed that Minnie wished to become astronauts when she grew up, but that sadly did not happen. The detectives got a hold of her journals and found out a list of the astronomy websites that she used to follow. And undoubtedly, this showed how great an interest she had in this field. Later, when the DNA test reports were made, the investigating team narrowed down to three people, one of them being Martinez, aka Jupiter Joe. The team held him to be a prime suspect. Wondering why? Well, this is because Martinez was found to be on the 19 to 99 list of tenants who dwelled in the building where many used to reside with her family. Thanks to the upgraded technology of DNA testing, the investigating team came up with a vital result. They found out the DNA sample from Martinez matched the semen sample that was found on a mini sweatshirt. Martinez, popularly known as Jupiter Joe, was called so because he used to offer improvised astronomical lessons for several children worldwide. Oh, yes. He also had a YouTube channel where he used to upload his astronomy-based videos. This apparently good-natured soul was the one behind the murder of Little Minnie. He had brutally killed her by first compressing her neck and then attempting to sexually assault her. But in the course of trying to do that, Minnie died in the cold-blooded Jupiter Joe or Martinez was cold-blooded enough to dump her body in the dumpster in the Bronx. Martinez had thought that he had succeeded in escaping from the clutches of the NYPD. After all, the detectives did not get to catch him for over 22 years. Jupiter Joe, who is now 49 years old, was ultimately arrested by the investigating team. Raymond said that the arrest was indeed a tremendous relief. I hope she's smiling at us. I hope that she sees all the people who cared and that she knows she wasn't forgotten. Many will now be happy to see how her murder will rot in prison. Number 4. Emma Jane Walker, A Tragic Tale Emma Jane Walker was a 14-year-old high school student, a delightful young lady with a close-knit family and friends who adored her to death. Emma got admission to Knoxville Central High School, Tennessee, just two years before her death. Her friends described her as having a bubbly and fun personality. She was the only one in her junior year to get selected for the Central High Cheerleading Team. She had a bright future and wanted to become a nurse. Amidst her charismatic personality, Emma craved love. Therefore, while cheerleading, she caught the attention of William Riley Gall. William was two years older than Emma and was a star football player on his team. At that time, Riley was already dating a girl, but he broke up with her to be with Emma. It was a perfect love story, a popular football player and a cheerleader. They both seemed to be head over heels in love with one another. Emma's friends described Riley as a bit shy but extremely possessive about her. Their love story made Central High's headlines as Emma kept posting on social media about how happy she was with her boyfriend. Emma's parents also described Riley as a very sweet and generous guy who always made their daughter laugh. Despite their approval of Riley, they kept a close check on their daughter's phone to ensure the couple wouldn't cross any limits. Fast forward a few months later, Riley's behavior started changing immensely as he started controlling whatever Emma did. Her parents saw the toxicity in their daughter's relationship and decided to step in and take her phone away. This did not stop Emma from contacting Riley as he gave her an iPod touch with which she would text her boyfriend secretly. Two years had passed, and Emma was 16 years old now. Her relationship with Riley kept getting worse day by day. Riley would text her things like, you are dead to me, and I won't ever see your face again, to things like, I am really sorry, you know that I love you. It was getting harder for the Walkers to see their daughters suffering because of her boyfriend. Riley's mom, Jill Walker, asked Riley to stay away from her daughter to protect her. Finally, in the fall of 2016, Emma broke up with her player boyfriend. Around that time, Riley had graduated from high school and had been a junior at Maryville College, which was only 30 minutes away from Emma's house. This was a deal-breaker for Riley as he tried to take his own life by swallowing Vicodin pills in his dorm room. His friends witnessed his behavior and how much he was obsessed with Emma. Meanwhile, Emma's life started getting better. She began spending quality time with her family and friends and realized that she deserved better. 
things started getting back to normal for the Walker family, as the breakup proved to be healthy for their daughter. It was a normal Saturday, and Emma was at a house celebrating their victory in the annual football game. Around midnight, Emma started receiving mysterious texts. The text asked her to come outside alone, or they would kill someone she loved deeply. She told her friend Zach about these anonymous messages, and he suspected that it would probably be Riley trying to get back together with Emma. Terrified by the text, Emma and Zach went out and found a man lying face down near a ditch. To their surprise, it was Riley. He told Emma and Zach that he had been kidnapped and did not remember anything as he was unconscious. Nobody believed him and said that he was doing this just to get sympathy from Emma. A day or two had passed when Emma had been home alone and saw a man in a black hoodie standing outside her window. She was terrified and texted Riley out of fear, saying, I hate you, but I need you right now. He got a text from Riley that he was speeding over to her house to save her. Jill Walker came back to check up on her daughter and found Riley sitting in her front yard. She got furious and asked Riley to leave her property immediately. Emma told her mom the entire situation and asked her to be gentle with Riley, as he was only there to help her. Emma's friends again suspected that the mysterious man who was talking to her was none other than Riley himself. Following the days after this incident, Emma's parents never left her side, as they were scared for their daughter. By Sunday night, everything had returned to normal. November 21, 2016 It was a normal Monday morning when Jill Walker went to her daughter's room to wake her up for school. To her surprise, her daughter had no pulse. She freaked out and called 911 immediately. The ambulance came and rushed Emma to the nearest hospital, but it was too late. Emma was already dead. The hospital observed that she had been killed due to gunshots. The demise of a 16-year-old girl with a notably bright future made headlines throughout Tennessee. The investigations began as the Walkers and the entire Central High community mourned the loss of Emma Walker. Many condolences came in, including Emma's ex-boyfriend, who started posting her photos on social media, claiming how much he missed her and hoped that she would be in a better place. During the investigation, the police found two bullet holes outside Emma's room. The doctors told the police that Emma had been shot twice, with one bullet hitting her ear and killing her instantly, and the second one hitting her pillowcase. The police started interviewing all the suspects, and one name kept coming up, William Riley Gall. Emma's parents and friends testified that Riley had been trying to scare Emma into getting back together with him. Riley's college roommate made a statement that the night before Emma's death, Riley had asked him how to remove fingerprints from a gun. This intrigued the police, and they started investigating the 18-year-old college student further. Riley had shared a secret with his friends that after he got kidnapped, he had taken a gun from his grandfather to protect himself. This heightened suspicions even more. When the police checked the records, it came to light that Riley's grandfather had reported his gun as stolen. There was no room for confusion anymore. Noah and Alex, Riley's best friends, were also helping the police solve Emma's murder. The police asked them to secretly record Riley and try to get him to confess to the murder. They both agreed and asked Riley questions about the homicide. Riley asked his best friends if they would help him get rid of the gun in the Tennessee River, as he could go to jail because of that. At this point, it was all clear that Riley was the one who murdered his ex-girlfriend. The police took him into custody and asked him questions regarding the murder. He kept denying it, but his phone location showed otherwise. It was seen that Riley was outside Emma's house the night she was killed. It was 3 a.m. when Riley was seen going back to Maryville College. The police also found black clothing and shoes in Riley's car, making it clear that he was stalking Emma. The evidence was crystal clear and 48 hours after Emma was murdered, Riley was in handcuffs. The trial of William Riley Gall began, and it was argued that he was Emma's hero, and it was just a clumsy act to scare Emma into coming back together with him. His intentions were never to kill her. However, this defense did not hold, and the jury eventually reached its final decision. William Riley Gall was charged with first-degree murder, stalking, theft, and possession of a firearm. He received a lifetime prison sentence with a maximum of 52 years before he could even be considered for parole. This has been a tragic case, a depressingly common type of homicide. Such cases are always hard to decipher, whether they are a reality or not. 